It was October 2007. I was 12, and my brother was 14. It was pretty chaotic. Cops came in. We got taken into a van. And from then, just drove off. I couldn't really understand it. I mean, as a little kid, just thinking, hey, you're taking from your family, and you're putting in another home, and that's your family. I had my daughter at a very young age. A couple of months later, I got pregnant again. They say that, um, that I couldn't be living in a basement due to that I was pregnant and I had already a baby. So that's when ACS took my sister, me and my daughter into the system. I was 13 when that happened. When I first got into the system, the first thing I wanted was to go home. My mom, she was on drugs, yes, and we got beaten, yes, but I grew up for that to be my safety and to be taken away from that was traumatic. If the system worked as it should, there would be no need for CASA, but it doesn't. It is bureaucratic. There are many parties involved, caseworkers, attorneys. You go for one appointment and then you're given another appointment. In order to proceed from A to B, you have to go visit C over there and get this other thing signed. And if someone isn't there advocating and calling and on top of you, you have to do this, you have to go there. You're just you're frozen. You just don't know where to turn. So we need a CASA to ensure that the system works. A CASA volunteer is an advocate for a foster youth who is in care. We are appointed by the judge, and we are a neutral person in the courtroom. We're problem solvers. We're fixers. We're cheerleaders. We don't have any other agenda besides the well-being of the children. Our goal is always, first and foremost, to get children returned to their parents whenever their parents are able to provide a safe and stable home environment. And when that can't happen, then we work towards adoption or permanent guardianship. You're meeting children at a very vulnerable, challenging time in their lives. They're separated from their parents. All that's familiar to them, it's gone and you get to create a positive difference in their lives. Randy came into my life, I believe around when I was like 13, 14. She showed up like at a hearing. My father had got deported and my mother was like on drugs. And I just had this wall up of, I don't trust you. When I first got involved with Nigel, he was having trouble in middle school. And I spoke to his guidance counselor and she said, Nigel's really a good kid. He's really a good kid, but he has an anger management problem and it keeps getting him in trouble. And he kept getting into trouble and into trouble and wound up incarcerated. Throughout the time that I spent in foster care, nobody really was there for me. That was just another number in the system. So when I met Stephanie, I had the idea that she wasn't gonna be very helpful. You volunteer for a situation like this, and you have a very strong impulse to jump in and fix things. And CASA warns you that you want to tread lightly. The first thing you want to do is listen. Part of our training is something called relentless engagement. And it's the idea that you should expect when you're working with a young person or often with a parent to be rejected. You should expect that they're gonna be angry at you, that they're not gonna trust you, that they're not gonna return your calls. And if you keep showing up anyway, eventually they will begin to slowly but surely trust you. It's gonna take a while, but we get it. Our youth do not make it easy at all. So I tell my advocates that if a youth curse you out, that they actually get uncomfortable with you. After a couple of times meeting up, I was thinking, you know, she came into my life for a reason. She had in her, you know, in her mind that I could do much more than what I was doing. For Nigel, too, he had to take his time to realize that I was there to accept him and be present for him. And I think that was a whole new thing for him. He was in prison for three years, and he was there alone. There was no one there for him. I can't imagine being in prison for three years and having no one that cares about you. Absolutely no one. So from that point on, I thought, I'm gonna stick with this kid, he's gonna make it. It would all, like, she just kept my head up. She showed me, like, this is not your life, you know? Like, this don't gotta be just the end of the road. 
And at some point I said something where I used the word volunteer. And I, I saw her face just completely change. She said, you, you don't get paid for this? You're just doing this to help out? She was, yes. And kind of shocked me a little bit because like my whole life, I never had someone that cared so much like she did. She pushed me to, to do better. The impact of life itself is overwhelming. So when you don't have nobody in your corner, man, that weight just gets heavier and heavier. The youth in the system, that's all they need is just that little bit of hope. That little bit of sunshine will make them shine, <laughs> basically. You're just there for them. It's a small thing, and yet it's the biggest thing of all. Because at the end of the day, this is what we want. Somebody to stick with us through thick and thin and not give up.